So uh, thank you, Cody, for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And my task is to sort of go through the history of uh, melanoma research and how we got to the current therapies. And um, it's really an exciting story. And it's one that not only impacts the lives of people with melanoma here in DC, but around the world, and also has had great impact on the treatment of other types of cancers, as you will hear. And so then I'll set the stage for the next two speakers who'll focus on brain mets and, and current clinical trials. So these are my disclosures. And just as background, um, melanoma, there's about 100,000 cases a year right now, about 7,500 deaths. It represents about 5% of all cancers, about 1% of all cancer deaths. So we actually do better in melanoma than we do with most cancers. It's the fourth most common cancer in men and the fifth most common in women. And the incidence has been increasing faster than any cancer. That's the bad news. But the death rate has also been decreasing faster than all other cancers. And that's because of early detection and better treatments. And right now, 90 to 95% of patients diagnosed with melanoma will be cured of their disease. So how did we get there? Well, the, it used to be when I was in my training that melanoma was called the cancer that gives cancer a bad name. And that was because it was increasing uh, mortality compared to other cancers. Median survival remained stuck at six to nine months in most studies, and less than 10% of people were alive at two years. And there were few, if any, effective treatment options for patients other than surgery prior to 2011. And those that were there, such as uh, decarbazine chemotherapy or IL-2, had limited or no effect on overall survival, significant toxicity, and there were no positive randomized trials comparing one treatment to, to a standard of care, which was usually decarbazine. So one of the treatments that was available, I was fortunate to be involved in developing, which was high-dose IL-2. And these are response duration curves for patients treated with, um, gosh, for patients treated with, I don't have a pointer. So for patients treated with uh, high-dose IL-2, you can see that after about the 24-month point, these curves tend to flatten. The CR curve is at the top, partial response curve second. And there are really no relapses after 2.5 years. So essentially, two or to four months of treatment. And then the um, um, long-term benefit for the patients who are having major responses. And so even though high-dose IL-2 is rarely used anymore, because we have so many better treatments, it was really proof of principle that immune therapy, um, if given in the best way to appropriate patients, could produce cures. And that's what kept the field of immunotherapy going while we were searching for better treatments. So these were the survival rates as of 2011 for the various stages of melanoma. And for stage four, you can see this 10% of patients alive at uh, five years, oh, excuse me, at two years, um, which was the state even with high-dose IL-2. So since 2011, we've had this revolution of treatments that have been developed for melanoma, and they're all shown here, I'll go through most of these, which has changed the five-year survival from less than 5% to greater than 50% for patients with stage four melanoma meeting. There is no median survival for that disease. So here's what I'm gonna talk about, targeting molecular changes within the tumor 
and the role of BRAF and MEK inhibitor therapies, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, adjuvant and some neoadjuvant therapy, and some recent advances. So this is uh, the awful case of melanoma that had a BRAF mutation about uh, 2011 when the BRAF inhibitors were first developed. And this patient got vemurafenib, and this was a miracle. He went from this to all these bumps being practically gone within a short period of time. That's the good news. The bad news was soon thereafter, somewhere around six months thereafter, his tumors were coming back. So that's the story of BRAF inhibitors, high response rates, short-lived responses. But fortunately, we found that if you could block not only BRAF, but block a molecule downstream from BRAF, MEK, you could have higher response rates and more durable responses and less toxicity. And as a consequence, there were um, several studies that were developed that showed that these combinations were better than single agent um, BRAF inhibition. This is data from the COMBI-D trial showing that 51% of patients were alive at two years, and that was superior to what was seen with just uh, gibrafenib alone. And so now there were three combinations of BRAF MEK inhibitors that were all studied compared to vemurafenib, and each one had improvement in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio in the 0.54 to 0.58 range. So not really much to choose from an efficacy standpoint between these therapies. But there were some differences in toxicities as shown here. There was a higher rate of fever with dubrafenib, termetinib, a higher rate of photosensitivity with vemurafenib and cobimetinib and encorafenib and vinimetinib, which was the latest combination, had lower rates of those particular toxicities, had continuous therapy, um, and um, appeared to have the longest PFS in the initial trials. And while um, dubrafenib termetinib is the combination that has shown activity in brain metastases and has uh, adjuvant therapy approval. So in looking at um, all of these studies, this is data from um, pooled dubrafenib termetinib data, we can identify some patients who are most likely to benefit. And those patients who have low or normal LDH have um, small volume disease and less than three organs involved have a complete, have an overall response rate of about 83% and complete response rate about 42%. So that's the group that tends to benefit the most, although everybody gets at least some short-term benefit. When we're looking at these BRAF-targeted therapies, they've been a great advance, very useful, but they do have some limitations, as I've been mentioning. They largely delay but don't prevent disease progression. They have some ongoing toxicities while you're taking the therapy, and only rarely can the treatment be stopped without the disease coming back. Usually about 30 to 50% of patients, even with complete responses, will have disease come back within six months of stopping treatment. Intermittent therapy, which was actually tested in the Southwest Oncology Group, was less effective than continuous therapy. And although there's activity in the CNS, um, as you'll hear from the next speaker, Dr. Hamid, they generally lack great CNS penetration or activity. So I'm gonna switch gears now to immunotherapy, which I think is a true revolution in the way we treat all different types of cancers, and it's been led by developments in um, patients with melanoma. And so the first thing to comment on is that all tumors have mutations, and these mutations represent potential foreign proteins, 
or antigens that could be recognized by the immune system and attack. And the host immune system is really the dominant active enemy faced by any developing cancer. And all successful cancers therefore must solve the challenge of overcoming defenses erected by the host immune system. And fortunately, there are some simple ways in which many cancers do that. And when we try to overcome those defenses, we call that cancer immunotherapy, which is really treating the immune system so that it can treat the cancer. And because the activated immune system can target many different of those mutated proteins simultaneously, it's not like giving just a block in a single pathway, it's machine gunning the tumor, and it can deepen and broaden over time, and therefore can eliminate the last tumor cells and lead to cures. And the hallmark of an effective immunotherapy, therefore, is a tail or a plateau developing on the Kaplan-Meier curve, as I showed you with those responders to IL-2, and as we see with the CTLA-4 antibody uh, ipilimumab, um, shown here with about 20% of patients now being on that tail of the curve, which starts at about three years. And there's a picture of Jim Allison, who got the Nobel Prize for his discovery of um, CTLA-4 as a checkpoint. And if you want to learn more about that, there's actually been a movie that's been um, uh, out there since 2019 called The Breakthrough, which describes the development of CTLA-4 antibodies, and it's a really a great story. But the real workhorse in immunotherapy is the PD-1 pathway and, and blocking that pathway. And what PD-1 does is when it's expressed on activated T cells and binds to PDL1 on tumor cells, the immune system gets shut off. And these antibodies can block that interaction, which can restore the immune system uh, activity against the tumor and allow it to actually finish uh, the job of uh, killing the tumor where possible. And it's interesting that the p tumor types that respond to anti-PD-1 are those which have the highest mutational burden in melanoma because a lot of it is related to sun damage and sun damage causes mutations in the tumors. These are passenger mutations, not the driver mutations like the BRAF mutation. Melanoma is one of the tumors that's most responsive to immunotherapy, particularly the anti-PD-1s. And here's an example of an early patient who had received high-dose IL-2 in biochemotherapy and ipilimumab who got pembrolizumab. And you can see this um, mass on the CT scan um, that I wish I could actually point to up in the left hand corner of the initial images and also in the liver. And after a year of treatment, it was essentially gone and this patient is doing well now a decade after that. And so pembrolizumab or Keytruda, the drug that Jimmy Carter got, was approved for the treatment of melanoma in 2014. And the other anti-PD-1, nivolumab, was also approved. So one question people ask is, which one should they get? And essentially, they're the similar, they're identical efficacy in melanoma, either in metastatic disease or adjuvant therapy. It's really hard to tease out that one is better than the other. And as Tony Rebus has said, they're really Coke and Pepsi. And therefore, the choices are largely based on other factors such as schedule, time to approval, marketing, the cost of the drug, or the experience with these agents in other cancers, or the efficacy of combinations. And with regard to schedule, the companies have been playing leapfrog, initially Q2 weeks, then Q3 weeks, then Q4 weeks, then Q6 weeks. So that's where we're at for therapies. And you might choose one of the treatments versus another because you'd have to go to the doctor less. But the real advance, in my opinion, um, 
that has made melanoma different than some of these other cancers was the early institution of both CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 together, taking these two Nobel Prize winning uh, discoveries and putting them together. And generally people say immunotherapy works slowly, but I think that's actually not the case. As you'll see from this example of this man who has this melanoma on his scalp that was eroding through his skull, had no other treatment options. He got Nevo Ippi, and these are weekly photos. You can see this mass getting smaller, getting smaller, and by nine weeks, it's gone. And so this is probably what's happening in many patients inside their body. You can't see that because you're not doing a CAT scan every week, but that's quick. And we know that from our neoadjuvant studies, where even disease in lymph nodes that looks like it hasn't changed um, after a six-week period when you take the um, lymph node out 60% uh, of the time, there's no tumor there. So immune therapy actually works quick, and it just may not show up as quickly, as, it changes as quickly as with the BRAF MEK inhibitors. So in the Checkmate 067 study, um, compared nevo ipi to nevo to ipi, and the combination, the red line here, was better than both IPI and NEVO single agents um, with a, about a five to 8% difference in the tail of the survival curves out at 6.5 months, 6.5 years, excuse me. And when you looked at the BRAF mutant population, that difference was even more profound with 14% difference between NEVO IPI and NEVO at 6.5 years. Um, uh, on these uh, survival curves. But unfortunately, um, nevo ipi is also associated with higher toxicity, and these toxicities are immune-related adverse events where the immune system is not only active against the tumor, but also recognizes self. And you can see that um, in the graph in the lower corner that some of those common toxicities are rash or liver problems or diarrhea or colitis or endocrine abnormalities and give a sense of when they happen. Um, and um, they're probably twice as likely with nevo ipi as with uh, nevo monotherapy. But at least in my view, toxicity is not all bad because um, it allows you to potentially stop the therapy and it's also associated with better efficacy. The yellow curve here are patients who didn't have toxicity. The um, red and the blue curves that overlap are the patients who had some toxicity and patients who had more severe toxicity but required steroid treatment. And the upper curve, which just has about nine uh, subjects on it, are patients who had toxicity severe enough to get both steroids and an immunosuppressive agent. So toxicity, um, I view it more as an endpoint because we can usually control it. And it's also an opportunity to stop um, the treatment because we've reached that endpoint. And in the um, 067 trial, you can see that for patients on nevo ipi, about 77% of those <clears throat> patients had been able to stop treatment successfully, and there was 145 patients who were still alive and three quarters had stopped treatment. <coughs> Only 5% um, were still on treatment, and about 18% um, were uh, on a subsequent treatment. And so what that allows is for um, oncologists to uh, accomplish the patient's goal, which is the treatment ends but the benefit persists. And this uh, property has um, changed my oncology clinic to a virtual travel agency where patients who are freed from their melanoma therapy and free from the complications of melanoma are traveling the world, um, fulfilling their bucket list of places they want to go, and also attending milestone events that they never would have 
thought possible and certainly wouldn't have been possible for most of them prior to 2011. So one of the reasons why these responses are so durable, and uh, Dr. Hamid will talk about this in much more detail, is that most patients with metastatic melanoma probably have subclinical brain mets. But um, nevo Ipi works in the CNS, at least for patients with asymptomatic brain mets, as well as it does systemically. So we're not seeing isolated CNS relapses the way we used to with some of our early patients, even our best responders. And here's brain MRI from a patient of mine who had multiple uh, CNS um, metastases here in 2015. And here is the patient in 2022. She um, uh, happens to be a neuroscientist, runs the brain bank at the NIH. And here's a uh, 3D print of her own brain with the metastases there that, that she's standing showing. And as I said, immunotherapy is active in the CNS as, as it is in systemic disease. And this patient has written a book about her journey, which I encourage all of you to read. It's quite a compelling story. And hopefully someday it'll be a movie. And if so, I want Tom Hanks to play me. Um, <laughs> so um, this is um, 2011 story of BRAF mutant melanoma. We've raised the bar, splayed the curve with BRAF MEK inhibitors, raised the bar with nevo -Ipi. And the question in 2015 was, which approach was preferred for these BRAF uh, mutant, patients with BRAF mutant tumors? And given that patients would have access to both treatments, is there an optimal sequence? So to address this question, we launched the DreamSeq trial, which randomized patients with BRAF mutant melanoma to receive immunotherapy first, followed by targeted therapy if they progress versus the um, reverse sequence. And so this was the endpoint of the trial was two year landmark overall survival. And these are the overall survival curves. The one in black is the immunotherapy first curve. The one in red is the targeted therapy first curve. And as you can see, there was a little benefit for targeted therapy early on, but by 10 months, these curves had crossed. And at two years, there was a 20% difference favoring immunotherapy first. And at three years, that difference was 24%. So this study addressed the question definitively that you should give immunotherapy first to these patients if you could. So why was the immunotherapy uh, first approach better? Well, first, the tumor responses were more durable with immunotherapy, with 88% of the responses ongoing compared to half of the patients with targeted therapy having progressed. As I mentioned, fewer patients develop CNS relapse because when immunotherapy works, it should also work on asymptomatic CNS metastases. Another important factor was that targeted therapy is really a good second line treatment. It works as well in the second line after immunotherapy as it does up front, while immunotherapy given second doesn't do as well as given up front. And um, when we looked at all the different subsets of patients who were on this trial, we could see that the IO therapy first approach worked better for all the different subsets including that patient population who responded best to BRAF MEK inhibitors that I mentioned earlier. So another approach to try to use these, molecule, these agents together was to combine IO with targeted therapy. And so these are called triple therapies, and there were three studies that were done comparing an anti-PD-1 or PDL one plus a BRAF MEK inhibitor to a BRAF MEK inhibitor. And these are the progression-free survival curves for all of those studies, both arms. You can see there's a little bit of an improvement for in progression-free survival for the triplets versus the doublets. But there's not really that tail on these curves the way we see with immunotherapy. And at the five-year time point for nevo -Ipi, the PFS in the BRAF mutant population was above where the uh, 
uh, PFS was for these triple um, uh, regimen treated patients. And the nevo ipi treated patients who hadn't progressed could still get targeted therapy if they progressed, while the triplet patients had already received both regimens. Now, there may be a role, as was recently presented, for um, um, this triple therapy in some patients with aggressive disease. Here's some data. Patients with high LDH and greater than three metastases showing that the triple drug was better than the combination doublet in the patients, but still don't see a tail on these curves, and this tail looks like it's less than what we'd see with immunotherapy for these patients. So in looking at triple therapy, I think it's really um, not something that has caught on with the medical community, even though there is a triplet approved. And um, ultimately, for me, it's hard to identify a patient population who should receive triple therapy versus sequence IO and targeted therapies. So what about uh, uh, more recent studies? So one thing about anti-PD-1 is very well tolerated, and it's served as therefore a backbone for other type of combination regimens. And in 2018 or so, there were something like 1,800 trials going on in cross-oncology with PD-1 inhibitors as a backbone. Right now, it's probably double that. Um, and one of the trials that actually turned out to be positive was the uh, Relativity 47 trial, which looked at um, anti-PD-1 nivolumab together with another antibody that blocked another checkpoint, LAG3. And as you can see from this um, slide here, the combination of Nevo plus the LAG3 inhibitor relatlumab or RELA was superior to Nevo monotherapy. And that comparing the um, Nevo IPI to Nevo RELA, both compared to Nevo in these two trials, you can see that for m many of the different subsets, they were um, fairly comparable hazard ratios. Potentially one difference was the BREF mutant population where the hazard ratio appeared to be better for nevo ipi than nevo rela. And so in looking at this other combination, which is now FDA approved, it represents an alternative frontline therapy for patients with metastatic melanoma. The overall activity uh, relative to nevo appears similar to what we see with nevo ipi with about half the toxicity. And it's particularly active in patients with low PDL1 expressing tumors, and the activity doesn't appear to be as strong as Nevo Ipi in the BREF mutant population, and there's no data left yet available on how it works in the CNS or whether you can stop treatment, although it's um, conceivable that we'll see some activity in those type of studies uh, if they're carried out in the future. And therefore, at least in our practice, we currently favor this approach for our BREF wild-type patients without CNS metastases, particularly if they um, have an assay that shows their PDL1 low. And um, it could be a very useful agent for studying in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant study, and maybe Dr. Bookbinder will talk about that in her talk. Another neoadjuvant approach excuse me, another combination of a LAG3 inhibitor plus an anti-PD-1 is from, rep, um, from Regeneron looking at fianolumab and uh, simiplumab, and you can see a relatively high response rate of 60%, a lot of tumor shrinkage um, in the waterfall plots, and a relatively tolerable regimen. So we'll hear more about this treatment going forward. But not all is rosy in melanoma. Some of our phase three trials that we thought would be great turned out to be dry wells. And that's including um, an IDO inhibitor trial, um, a trial with a novel IL-2 called BEMPEG, 
and a trial with TBEC, a drug that's actually approved. And so we looked at these trials and wanted to, we think that they're, um, this is not good for the field, it's not good for the companies, it's certainly not good for the patients who participated in these trials in comparison to other trials where um, there may have been a more of an advance. And so we looked at some properties related to these trials that failed and tried to sort out for the investigators and potentially for the patients how you would choose um, to go from phase two promising data to phase three. And we broke that down in something we recently published into um, steps, uh, mechanisms of biology, phase one and phase two data, trial design, and um, potential for impact. And we looked and basically we thought that if there was um, single agent activity, um, if there was a, a randomized phase two study that showed that the combination was better than um, the standard of care, or if there was activity in a PD-1 refractory population, particularly if it produced a durable benefit, then that was a property that could lead you to go to a phase three trial. And if you didn't have any of those things, then you would need a lot of these other characteristics to be enthusiastic about that phase three trial. So I'm gonna close by talking about um, some data with the adjuvant setting. Um, and at least in my view, if um, moving, if we were gonna accomplish Vice President Biden, now President Biden's goal of uh, trying to uh, reduce cancer-related mortality by 50% over the next decade. The best way to do that is to give adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy to all the different tumors where anti-PD-1 show efficacy. We have th um, three different approaches for adjuvant therapy for phase, for stage three patients. The um, um, dibrafenib trametinib that I mentioned previously, uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and all of them have now reported out five-year data which shows about a 50% reduction in relapse-free or distant metastasis-free survival, which is a surrogate for um, preventing disease from coming back. So it's hard to choose between those various therapies. Um, one approach that was recently presented that um, I think was also just published in the New England Journal looked at giving the therapy before surgery. And in some prior studies, the small studies that were compiled by um, uh, a group of individuals involved in the neoadjuvant consortium, you can see that um, that there was a response rate of about 20% to anti-PD-1 in the neoadjuvant setting in that um, lymph node in the pathologic CR rate of 21%, while Nevo plus IPI had a pathologic CR rate in the 50 to 60% range. And very few of the patients with either a pathologic um, CR or a major uh, partial response um, actually relapse over time. In contrast, targeted therapy when given in the neoadjuvant setting, those responses were not as durable. So to formally address the question of is um, neoadjuvant therapy better than adjuvant therapy is treating while the, the actual therapy is still in place, which are the lymphocytes that are in your draining lymph node, which are probably enriched for cells that might recognize the tumor, is giving therapy three cycles of Pembro and then before surgery and then 15 cycles after surgery better than just doing surgery and giving 18 cycles of Pembro. And as was reported uh, by Dr. Patel in the New England Journal um, just last week, you can see that the neoadjuvant arm was dramatically better than the same therapy given 
in the adjuvant setting, 20% difference. So um, I'll just close with some highlighting some other advances in the last year. Um, adjuvant therapy for um, Pembro and Nevo, stage 2B and 3A disease. Maybe Dr. Bookbinder will talk about this. An mRNA vaccine in the adjuvant setting, which also showed some promising data. There was some data in anti-PD-1 resistant disease from SWOG 1616 and some TIL data, and also some data coming out with uh, uh, oncolytic virus from Repilmoon and some engineered anti prame T cells, and also some data in uveal melanoma. This is the 1616 study data, which shows that Nevo IPI is better than IPI in patients who've progressed on single agent anti PD1. And this is data on taking those T cells out of the tumor, TIL therapy, um, compared to ipilimumab in patients that have progressed on anti PD1 from a Dutch group also recently published. <coughs> and then this interesting molecule, Timbentifus, which is a way to get immune therapy to patients who don't have a lot of uh, immune cells, uh, don't have a lot of mutations in their tumor and therefore a lot of immune cells that can target it by sort of creating this molecule that can um, have an antibody recognizing something on melanoma on one end and something that brings T cells to the tumor on the other end. And in a phase three trial in patients with metastatic uveal melanoma, you can see an improvement in overall survival of the blue curve that was even greater than what was seen with uh, progression-free survival. So next steps, and you'll hear about this, um, are biomarkers to determine which patients to treat with specific anti-PD-1 regimens, better treatments for checkpoint inhibitor and targeted therapy resistant patients, improving therapies for variant melanoma, and treatment of patients with symptomatic CNS disease, including LMD. And so there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to address these problems. You'll hear from the speakers about some of that research. But I want to close by saying, as we're developing new therapies for melanoma, our goal should not be simply to turn melanoma into a chronic disease. We should be striving to make melanoma a curable disease. And to do that, I think we have some of the tools and some of the past decade um, is making that dream become a reality, but we still have work to do. So this is my team at Georgetown. And uh, these are all the people who I've collaborated with, including my, my funding sources, including the MRA. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I think we have time for two or three quick questions. Um, Dr. Atkins, um, my name is Colleen Wittosh. I am a stage four metastatic melanoma brain mets only. I was treated at MD Anderson through Jim Allison, Dr. Tabi, and Dr. Amaria. I'm a five-year survivor, scans all clear last week, and that is because of the research that you guys do and that opportunity um, to have that type of uh, phase two clinical trial available for patients. So. Yeah, so were you on the Checkmate 204 study? Um, I'm not really familiar okay. <laughs> with how you're saying that. Yeah. So um, mine was a phase two clinical trial that just came through when um, Dr. Allison, that was before 2018, yeah. um, that you, so you probably know more on that side yes. than I do. But it has totally been um, a life-changing experience for so many, not just myself. And what you guys do through that research, watching that, I mean, years ago, I would not have the opportunity to tell you guys. Thank you very much. Well, I take it you're one of our thrivers, not just surviving, but thriving and giving back. Yes. I'm from the mucosal melanoma gang. Um, fortunately, I've been told it was probably the earliest anybody ever caught it, only because nosebleeds were like canary in the coal mine. Jefferson University did the surgery. I 
move the radiation near my house just for convenience. A uh, single lung met a year later, NED 13 years as of close of business Friday. <laughs> what is the theory on why the rare melanomas and specifically mucosal are so less reactive to what we already have? Yeah, so great question. I think the simplest answer, although it may not be the total answer, is those melanomas, either mucosal melanomas, acromelanomas, or melanomas in the eye, have not driven by sun exposure. They have less passenger mutations in them and therefore are less recognizable as foreign by the immune system. And for the most part, they also don't have driver mutations in BRAF that can be targeted. Yes, well, the MRA is doing something like that, as you heard, and um, I'm there, we're trying to do those efforts as well across our melanoma community. We have one more question over here. Question, in your presentation in one of your graphs, you had the, um, the list of melanoma and how Ipinevo had worked, those therapies had worked on those specific mutants. Um, question is, you didn't have anything on mucosal melanoma. I'm sorry to bring it up again. Is that because there isn't enough information yet to be able to give that? So the 067 trial that I was talking about mm -hmm. enrolled patients with mucosal melanoma. There have been other trials that have looked at nevo ipi in that population, and that tends to be our standard of care for that population because it's the approach that brings new T cells to the tumor as well as activating them. And the activity in the mucosal melanoma population was about half of what it was in the overall population. Not zero, not 55% as the overall population, but about 25 to 30%. And many of those responses were durable. It's just, it's not where we want it to be, which is why we're trying to come up with better therapies. And maybe, as I talked about for uveal melanoma, some of those T-cell engagers may be the answer for these tumors that have less um, internal mutations and less immune recognition. And was BRAF the only marker that was used, or was CKIT used? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. This was immune I'll therapy, not afterwards. targeted therapy. Okay. Uh, okay, so these patients were getting immune therapy. All right, so thank you so much, Dr.